Hey there, wood turners. Welcome to my shop. How many of y'all got don't don't have an awl in your toolbox? Why not? These are fun, easy projects. They make great gifts uh, for any wood turner, uh, any flat worker, heck, anybody with a toolbox. Now I've got a neighbor who says he's only got two tools. He's got a credit card and a telephone. So if you got a friend like that that's tool challenged, heck, change the handle shape and make it an ice pick. So let's let's go ahead and get get started. And I want to talk about uh, all uh, very briefly. There's several different types. Uh, the most common ones are scratch awls with a long thin point, and then my favorite, and we'll, I'll show you a close up later, is the birdcage awl. Now I want to demonstrate how to make an awl, but I, I want to emphasize that my way is not the only way. My way, heck, may not even be the best way. Uh, any comments you've got are, are certainly uh, welcome. What it takes to make an awl is a piece of wood, uh, approximately four to five, five inches long. It takes a metal shaft of, of a suitable uh, steel, and I'll, I'll give you the source for that later. And it needs some type of uh, ferrule, as shown here in this, this picture. These are the requirements that you need to make an awl. In terms of the woods, I've made I've made awls, uh, all handles out of all types of domestic wood: oak, cherry, uh, maple, uh, laminated, um, uh, exotics. Exotics look nice. Uh, a figured wood looks very nice. Spalted wood looks nice as long as it's not not punky and, and will hold the the piece. Here's a few examples of some of the all all handles that uh, that I've made. You may want to experiment with some scraps of wood on the kind of handle that you've, you've got. So you might want to play with one and, and then get a shape you like uh, and then, then turn a final one. The awl is a great beginner project because it, it's simple and, and it meets the needs for a beginner or a novice turner to turn multiple copies of the same thing so you can practice your technique. Uh, I've heard it said before that the only way, there's only three ways to become a a good turner. Practice, practice, and practice. So this is a good a good uh, project to practice. I'll start off with this rectangular piece of wood, two inches square. In this case a little uh, shorter than what I mentioned before. This is going to uh, be a shape similar to that so I just need enough room to uh, to chuck it. If you've got a block of wood that's perfectly square, sometimes you can uh, initially chuck it in square into your jaws. In this case it won't quite fit. Uh, most of the time my wood is not square, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this between centers and put a tenon on it so it'll fit the chuck and we'll go from there. Generally to get started, I don't normally use a center finder. You just take a, take a pencil, most of y'all are familiar with this trick, hold it in a fixed position, make a smaller square so you got a target and then you can either use your center punch to simply mark the center. In some instances uh, a center punch will follow a hard grain and that's where you know this birdcage awl, birdcage awl can come in handy or if you don't have a center punch it becomes a nice tool to, to drill a hole for your live center or your dry center. Stock. Get it snug. We'll return to pretty high revolutions. This is a piece of Yucatan rosewood, so I think it'll look uh, look very nice. We're going to rough this out with a spindle roughing gouge. Turn it round. You know when you're roughing, you come off the right hand end, in case there's any cracks, you get rid of any large splinters that might come flying off. When you when you're running roughing down on the left end, you don't just keep coming down to the end, but you uh, tilt your roughing gouge toward the left and come off the left end in case there are any cracks 
you don't want any large splinters coming off and that's a safe way if you catch it behind rather than coming in this way and catching it and possibly throwing it in the face. Final touch up when I get it to chuck. I'm going to go ahead and put a tenon on here. Doesn't have to be very long. Take a knock out bar. Now I'm using a Technotool Nova Chuck with normal jaws. Uh, I think they may be called dovetail jaws, but only the outside is a dovetail. The inside is straight, but has a small lip. So I know there's a number of beginners that run into problems thinking they need to do a dovetail shape on the inside. You don't. That's a mistake. The manufacturer says make them parallel. The key is making a nice clean shoulder with nothing in there making it parallel. Turn it around and tighten it through another hole. Okay. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and cut uh, the tenon for the ferrule. Now, you can make ferrules out of any number of materials. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use a piece of uh, copper pipe uh, inside diameter is just a, a shade over uh, a half an inch. Uh, you can use brass. Uh, this is a little fitting that's got threads on it. I can clean up some of those threads uh, very easily. High speed steel versus brass. High speed steel wins it every time. So uh, you can clean those up. You don't have to bring it all the way down and it'll leave a nice design. Uh, I've even used uh, various uh, uh, cartridge cases or shells uh, for a ferrule. And a ferrule basically is just to reinforce the end to keep it from uh, the tool from flying off if it was really under pressure. But uh, you do want to put a ferrule on here. Now I can measure the ferrule and transfer that measurement, but really all I need to do is just to mark, put a mark on there. I'm going to take it down a little bit first, and then we'll get to that. I'm going to do is bring this tenon down to the appropriate size and the best way to do that is to caliper it. So I've already taken these calipers, measured the in inside, allowed myself just a scotch more, more room so I can sneak up on the fit. Uh, I've rounded over the end of these calipers. You don't want them sharp or they'll snag and you don't want this thing thrown in, into your forehead. We'll bring it down a little bit further. Now we can start sneaking up on it. Simply going to hold it in the back. One hand operation. By the way, when you're using a brass, uh, a brass, or uh, sorry, a copper pipe, where you're cutting it with a pipe fitter or a hacksaw or something, make sure you deburr it with some a deburring tool or a a reamer or a little sandpaper, so you don't have any uh, edges that's going to give you a false false shape. It's just starting on there.
I don't like to have a sloppy fit. I'm going to epoxy this on here, but I don't want to pound it on because it's soft copper. Okay, so we're going to uh, stop right here. I'm going to go ahead and glue that ferrule on with epoxy. We're going to let it dry. Then we're going to go ahead and drill the appropriate size hole for the shaft. Then we'll shape the handle. Okay, we're going to mix up a little epoxy here. Small amount. General purpose, it really doesn't make, make any difference whether you use uh, five minute or some other, they all seem to work well. Using those little craft sticks I talked about in my earlier video on tips, repurpose the top of a Pringles Pringles can. Put a generous amount on here, all the way around. Slide that on. Take my little Bradford pair enforcer. Then to drive it the last way, get another coupling the same size. And then you can hammer it right down to the wood, leaving it slightly proud, as I mentioned. And then now we're ready to let it dry for a little while, and then we'll come back and turn it off. So we're going to go ahead and drill that hole. I'm going to use the indexing on the uh, quill here to measure the depth. Use a, dr a drill bit approximately 1 64th larger than the hole, so in this case 5 64ths is a good size. Uh, we're going into end grain and hardwood, but so you can ramp this up to about 15, 1500 RPMs, good safe, safe speed. When you clear it with a Jacobs chuck, be sure you hold on to the Jacobs chuck when you retract it. You don't want it coming loose if it gets caught in there. And shape the uh, shape the handle to approximate something like like this. We'll probably put an embellishment or two, uh, maybe a bead, maybe some burn marks. So let's get started. Now I'm going to use this small six-inch ruler to mark off one inch and two inches to define where I'm going to change change the direction. This will be the end of the handle. We'll part off behind here and this will be the shape where it starts going down and we'll make this a large bead right here. I think a spindle turning project is well, well secured. We can ramp it up just a little bit on turning somewhere between 15 and 2000. basically a long cove right here and we're going to go ahead and turn a bead. I'm going to use this pyramid tool just to mark the end of the bead. Come in there and turn that bead. Now we're going to come down behind that bead. cut. It won't take much sanding. We're going to go ahead and we'll burn that in just a moment. Um, we'll 
sand this this off uh, in a moment polish it up let's go ahead and change um, we're going to actually start to cut from here this is going to be a bead on this end but we're going to start from here and move it down so the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and take a parting cut with a large uh, quarter inch parting tool right here to mark where I'm going to turn to Push straight in, and we're going to drop the, drop the handle. Now we're going to start finding the shape. This road wood, rosewood smells wonderful, very, very spicy. Uh, so that light looks good. I like that basic shape. I don't think I'm going to put anything here. I think I'll put a little burn ring there. And then we'll look at doing something maybe on the very end when we bring it down. So while we've got it here, let's go ahead and... You can use almost any kind of wire. This is a piano wire with a couple of knobs on the end. I'm going to get this out of the way turn it up to a high speed, then I'm going to drop my hand on the back to make sure we get lots of friction. Um, we've already got a little bit of a mark here for it to ride in, so I don't have to worry too much about it wandering. That's done. Turn it up a little bit and then we'll go maybe a grit or two finer. Then we'll go ahead and final shape here, part it off, reverse it, and clean it up. And 20. Got to the bead a little. Can't use the same paper because it'll pick up stuff from the metal that oxidizes and it'll get in your wood. So change paper when you're going from the copper or the shaft to wood. And let's make it shine. I'll just put a little 400 on here. Okay, we'll call that good. Now we're going to go ahead and finish shaping the bottom. Again, going back to our 3 8 inch spindle gouge. First I'm going to go ahead and take the parting tool and part down a little more. parting off. I'm going to switch to a thin parting tool because it's a little bit easier. Now, what some people like to do instead of parting off uh, finally is to use a thin, thin flush saw. I'm going to go ahead and part this off and then we're going to reverse it and clean it up. And what I'm going to do is take some um, masking tape and I'm going to wrap that ferrule and put it in uh, another chuck with some smaller jaws so I can reverse it and clean up the bottom. So bear with me. This is not real smooth, so let's hope we can get it to run. 
fairly true. Tighten it up. Don't want to squeeze it too hard. Okay. Now, I'm going to clean up the end of this thing, get it round again. Take very gentle cuts because it's leveraged out a little bit. These jaws aren't the strongest on something that sticks out, so I'm going to go very carefully. Lower the tool rest so I can cut on center. Now just take very light cuts. Very light cuts. Now this is holding pretty good, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is do a little texturing. Uh, a little bit of texturing is a nice, nice touch. Start with a little 220. I'm going to show up on the screen here what a sample of, of some texturing on a on another all bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and texture this one. I think this is this exotic Yucatan rosewood ought to, ought to texture pretty well. So I'm going to use a Wagner tool. Using the 16, 16 threads per inch. I don't want to get it dead center. I want to get it off a little bit. I want to make sure the cutter is parallel to the surface of the wood. And we want to get the speed down to oh, somewhere between 5 and 800. And the trick to this is you've really got to, it's not cutting the wood, it's embossing the wood. So once you get it engaged, you've got to hold it a little while, especially against a hard wood. People that don't get good results because they're impatient and they want to. Uh, give up too soon. So let's give it a shot. I'm going to touch the wood surface, hold it, hold it. And we got a bit of a texture there, not very pronounced. We're going to dress that up a little bit with by putting a couple of little small rings around it using a again my pyramid point tool. I'm going to put one on the inside. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Just put a little bit of a defining ring there. Go back and check see exactly where the outside of the texturing is. It's right here. So we're going to put just another little ring here. And to deal with any little frizzies, this uh, Scotch uh, Scotch Bright type pad does well to kind of burnish it up. And I think that's going to look real good. Let's see if you can you can see that it'll pop a little bit when we put some oil on it. But I think that adds just a nice little. Decorate a feature. Now we're going to go ahead. And, we're going to go ahead and put the shaft in there with a little epoxy, and then we'll talk about uh, grinding, grinding the tool shaft. Um, this project, I did an article on it a while back for Wood Turning Design. Rest in peace. Uh, you know they went bankrupt in August. Um, if if you're interested, you go. You can go to my blog site as shown here, and you can uh, download that article. I've also got a handout for this project if, if you're interested in looking at that also on my blog. Just click on the page that says Wood Turning Resources. 
Okay, yes indeed. Let's move over and talk about the shaft we're going to be using. Now, what I use is for the shaft is music wire. It's a uh, carbon steel, but it's, uh, it's pretty tough. It's very difficult to cut with a hacksaw, so you need to cut it off with a whiz wheel. Um, here's the name of the company. If it doesn't show up well in the video, I'll, uh, I'll put it on the screen. But it's K&S Precision Metals. The stock number is 508. Comes in three foot lengths, and I like to use the 5 seconds of an inch size. You might try something a little longer, 3 16 but this size I found works very well for me. Cut in in length somewhere 4 to 5 inches, maybe 5 inches uh, toward 5 inches for a uh, ice pick. Much more than 4 inches tends to get a little long for, a, uh, for an awl, but it's, it's your personal preference. I bury anywhere from an inch to, to an inch and a half inside the handle and have somewhere maybe uh, 3, 3 and a half inches uh, protruding. Other people I, I know have used uh, shafts out of a drill bit. Some people have used O1 uh, and W1 uh, steel that has to be hardened. I'm not familiar with that process. There are extra steps for me. Uh, these are fairly inexpensive. If you can find it in your local hardware uh, store, great. I've had a hard time finding them at big box home improvement centers. Hobby shops uh, sometimes uh, carry this, the ones that deal with remote control toys. You can also get it uh, off the internet, uh, Amazon and other vendors. It's fairly inexpensive, but uh, because of the shipping, you probably want to buy them in lots of uh, seven. Sometimes they package it in lots of seven. So you can get seven, seven of these uh, for, I think, approximately $14 maybe plus, plus shipping. So given that a, a 36 inch uh, piece of steel will give you somewhere around seven or eight uh, shafts, Th this is very, very inexpensive. You'll have almost a lifetime supply if you do uh, buy, buy seven of them. It occurred to me when I mentioned whiz wheel, I didn't ex really explain what that is, but that's a rotary tool with a uh, cut, off, cut off wheel. These are fairly inexpensive and actually they're very handy tools for a lot of things. I didn't get one until I started making awls and, and found that I was getting frustrated trying to cut it, cut this uh, uh, music wire with a hacksaw. is very difficult. I typically sharpen my awls with a sander. Um, I've got to admit that the oscillating sander uh, as it moves up and down uh, is a challenge because it tends to cause swirls. You might want to turn uh, grind yours on a grinder. If so, you might want to consider using the little jig shown in this picture where you drill a small hole, a hole that'll accommodate the shaft through a little piece of wood and use that as a jig so you can spin the, the tool against the, uh, against the grinding wheel. Now you need to keep in mind that this is not high speed steel, this is carbon steel and you can blue it very easily, especially the tip. So keep uh, water handy, uh, quench it uh, regularly. You can clean up your shaft and, and finish making it look, look nice by uh, cleaning it up with a little uh, progressive grits of uh, sandpaper, maybe starting at 240 and moving on up to 400 or 600. Until, until you get the thing nice and uh, nice and shiny and, and looking good. You might want to finish your handle. Some people just like to keep it the uh, natural wood and let, let it develop a patina. I use Minwax anti, uh, antique oil. I use that for most of my turnings. I'd only put on a couple of coats uh, and it'll, it'll make the detail pop, make it look shiny, really make it look, look nice. I told you I'd talk about a birdcage awl, uh, and, and now is the time. The birdcage awl is just a, it, it's an old design that comes uh, for, to us from maybe the 1800s where they used this four-sided uh, point, and I'll give you a close-up of that so you can see it. Um, maybe this is a, the best illustration comes from Derek Cohen of Perth, Australia. He had, uh, 
he allowed me to use his birdcage awl. Now it's instead of round, his is made out of a quarter inch square high speed uh, steel, but you can really tell that uh, you know what the shaft looks like in terms of the four sides. Now here's the beauty of it. The bird cage awl, as I understand it, was originally used for uh, making bird cages. It was used for drilling, drilling holes in, in bamboo or thin wood in the lateral uh, or, or the, the cross pieces in order that uh, you could insert pieces of wire in the hole. The beauty of it is, is it will drill because of those four sharp sides, it will drill a hole in thin wood very quickly and without cracking the wood. So it, it makes a, it, it, it's a really wonderful tool for starters. It uh, actually severs, severs the fibers and makes a hole very, very quickly. Okay, wood turners, we've talked to you about the purposes of an awl, why you need to turn one, what you need to turn one, and how you need to turn one. So time to get out and, and turn one. Uh, your feedback is certainly important to us, uh, so uh, comments are, are welcome. Uh, I'm reminded when I published the article on this uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I wound up getting an email from a gentleman, uh, a turner from Australia, who who explained to me about the birdcage awl, and now it's one of my, my favorite, favorite grinds. So comments are important, and if you've got questions, please post them. If you like this, watching this video, please click on like. If you want to see more of them, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.